Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet. My name is Andy Revkin, and we're going to explore today a concept called terror management theory on the Sustain What webcast. This is like webcast number 45, and it's certainly the first one in which this has come up. Although actually Peter Coleman here at Columbia University, who runs uh, initiatives on complexity, cooperation, and conflict, um, introduced me to this. Um, one of my big gaps in my own academic background, getting a biology degree and way back in 1978, and a journalism degree uh, was I didn't get into behavioral sciences much, and I really regret that, along with economics. And I never took a, st a statistics course. So there, I have been learning a lot on the run as, for 35 years as a journalist and now running this program at Columbia University, the Earth Institute, on how do we make information matter. It's an initiative on communication and sustainability. You're probably wondering a little bit, I'll introduce you to our guests in a second. You're wondering what you're looking at here. It's a piece of art that was created uh, when China was having its lockdown. There's an artist there, Gu, Gu Yuang, whose name I'm sure I'm maskering, who assembled 3,500 images posted by people in lockdown. And he made it into a kind of a collage. And you can see it best when I start to do this. You'll see what it is and you'll see why it's relevant. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, 3,500 images you can, uh, made into one image, obviously an allusion to Edvard Munch's um, The Scream. It's called 2020 Plague Expulsion Right by Wu Yong. And I've tweeted a link to um, the uh, piece in the South China Morning Post that brought my attention to this piece of art, which is so extraordinary. And Munch's piece is probably one, I can't think of a more iconic piece of art than that. Um, and this relates so powerfully to the work that Sheldon Solomon has been doing for decades, building on Ernst Becker and with Ernst Becker and others. So we're here to discuss this concept of how the background awareness we all have as humans after a certain age, and maybe you could talk about when, when that moment comes in human life, we are aware that we're, we're, we're transient, that we're passengers who have a finite ticket. And so many aspects of what we do and think, either whether consciously or unconsciously, are mediated by that awareness. Um, my friend Carl Safina, who just wrote a, has written two books on animals and intelligence and animal feelings. If I had him on with you, it'd be inter interesting to know if there's any advancement on whether any animals uh, other than humans have, have developed this, have, have signs, demonstrable signs of this kind of awareness and mortality and what it does. So I'm going to take, take us to a more normal view of the world uh, here in a second. Um, so we can start to discuss this. And uh, this, this uh, conversation was organized by Katie Kish, a Waterloo postdoc, who uh, can't be with us at the moment because of family, those kinds of family travails we all have these days, juggling um, you know, multidimensional lives in the same space often. So Katie might be able to join us later, but I owe, owe her a, a debt of gratitude for having the idea to bring in uh, Sheldon Solomon and Simon Dalby, who's at Wilfrid Laurier University. Sh uh, Sheldon is at Skidmore here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, I'm a little, I'm halfway down the Hudson Valley in Cold Spring, the Cold Spring Bureau of, of the Earth Institute. And we're gonna hear soon from uh, Norman Kearney, who's a doctoral candidate at Waterloo, and also from two friends of mine, Karen Malpede, who is a, a playwright whose last two plays, and I'm sure more, have really explored the frontiers of human relationship to really dramatic, <laughs> possibilities that we're entering now, biology and climate. Her plays um, kind of take this question into the future. How, how do we envision futures amid chaos and with those background fears? And what do we do with that? And also Susie Moser, Suzanne Moser, who's a consultant who's worked for decades in building uh, both internal resilience within people and resilient communities in the face of climate change and other disruptions. And her concept of the adaptive mind, to me, is very valuable in the context of terror management theory. But so first I wanted to kind of have Sheldon take the floor and um, talk, talk a little bit about this. So um, you, this is the 1970s or early 80s. When did this really crystallize and how? Well, um, thanks Andy for having me. And um, our ideas, uh, when I say our, I mean my buddy Jeff Greenberg and Tom Pazinski and myself were graduate students at the University of Kansas in experimental social psychology. Um, in the late 1970s. And uh, 
we got interested in Ernest Becker's work in 1980 when as a young professor at Skidmore College, I just stumbled across a book called The Denial of Death at our library that won a Pulitzer Prize in nonfiction, I believe in 1974. And I was captivated and with Tom and Jeff also by uh, Becker's broad claim that the uniquely human awareness of death uh, by virtue of the fact that we've got a big forebrain that allows us to imagine things that don't yet exist and then to make our dreams come into reality. Um, this is all great and explains why we're such a highly adapted creature. But one of the things that also happens inadvertently from our vast intelligence is that uh, we realize not only that we exist, uh, which is very uplifting, uh, but that we're not going to be here forever. And not only uh, will we not be here forever, but um, we know that our death can occur at any time for reasons that we could never anticipate or control. And, and moreover, um, as Freud points out, we also don't like the idea that we're embodied animals, uh, breathing pieces of defecating meat, no more significant than lizards or potatoes. And what Becker argues is that if that's all we thought about, I'm going to die, I could walk outside and get smote by a comet or a virus, um, we wouldn't be able to get up in the morning. We would be overwhelmed by debilitating existential terror that, according to Ernest Becker, we humans manage by embracing a culturally constructed beliefs. He called them cultural worldviews uh, that minimize death anxiety by giving us each a sense that life has meaning and that we have value. And accordingly, uh, what he insists is that whether we're aware of it or not, and mostly we're not aware of it, uh, that we spend most of our lives uh, trying to maintain confidence in the veracity of our belief systems and faith in our own self-worth. And uh, because of that, he argued, when existential concerns are aroused for a variety of reasons, uh, that this automatically instigates a variety of defenses uh, that help us bolster our, bolster our confidence in our beliefs and in our self-worth. And so that's really Becker in a nutshell. And where we come in in the 1980s is that Becker won a Pulitzer Prize, but he couldn't get a job as a professor. Uh, people dismissed his ideas as kind of fanciful speculation based on a combination of philosophy, theology, and uh, psychodynamic insights but uh, people just said there's no evidence for this uh, and nor can there be. And some other folks just said, well, so what? What can we, what do these ideas help us understand that would be tough to do otherwise? And so what we've been doing for the last 40 years are experiments that were designed to test hypotheses derived from Becker's ideas. And so, for example, our original interest was how come people can't get along with other folks who are different? Why do we hate people uh, and harm people who are different? And his response was, well, if our own beliefs help us manage death anxiety, uh, then the mere existence of other people is threatening because if we accept other beliefs, that undermines our confidence in our own. And that's why when we run into people that are different or who are different, rather, uh, we tend to disparage and demonize and even kill them. And, and sure enough, in our experiments, when we remind people that they're going to die by asking them to think about death or interviewing them in front of a funeral home, or even blasting the word death for 28 milliseconds on a computer uh, so fast that uh, you can't even uh, see what's happening. Um, well, what we know is if you remind Christians that they're gonna die, for example, they love Christians more and they hate Jewish people. If you remind Jewish people they're gonna die, they love Jewish people more and they hate Christians and Muslims. Germans reminded of their death uh, sit closer to, f to fellow Germans and further away from folks who look like immigrants. Iranians uh, reminded of death are more eager to become suicide bombers. Americans reminded of death are more eager to use nuclear weapons on countries 
that don't harm us. And mm. another area that we've worked in is how death anxiety influences political preferences. Um, so Max Weber at the beginning of the 20th century said, oh, uh, in times of historical upheaval, uh, when existential anxieties are apt to prevail, we tend to gravitate towards a certain kind of political leader. It was Weber who coined the term charismatic leader, uh, seemingly larger than life individuals who often claim that they're the only ones uh, who could make people safe uh, and prosperous. And this is often used uh, to explain Hitler's rise to power, could also be used to explain how President Trump got elected. So we've done experiments showing uh, that uh, in right before the last election, uh, American participants preferred Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump, except if you reminded them of their mortality first, in which case they now liked uh, Donald Trump a lot more. Uh, another area we've worked in is showing that when we remind people they're going to die, uh, they really become hostile to the idea that people are animals and we become uncomfortable with our bodies and we become uncomfortable in nature and we become more willing to greedily exploit non-renewable natural resources. And uh, real quickly, two other areas that we've worked in. One is in, um, in conspicuous consumption. We can't understand why we're trashing the environment unless we can understand uh, our insatiable desire for money and stuff. Uh, and what the Beckers of the world tell us is that any natural desire has an upper limit. You may love pizza, but after your 12th slice, you've had enough. But one thing that people never have enough of is money and stuff. And sure enough, you remind people they're going to die. They want more money. They want more luxury items. They want to be more rich and they want to be more famous. And then finally, when death is on our minds, it magnifies all pre-existing psychological disorders. So depressed people become more depressed, OCD people, more OCD, and so on and so forth. And so I've been a little long-winded, but that's- No, but that's, uh, that helps a lot to set the stage. And um, I'm gonna bring in actually, well, I'm gonna bring in Simon for sure, but also yeah. Susie, you know, I might get more of us on screen here right now. We, there, there's enough, we have screen, Time, screen space for six, and we are six. Um, I'm sad that Katie, uh, hopefully she's watching and can catch up, but uh, because so much of this resonates with things that Susie is thinking about and obviously the art, artistry of uh, Karen. So hold on a second here. Si Simon, just if you could briefly lay out your field, you know, you've, you're have you focused on a lot of what was just laid out by Sheldon was about the, in, you know, in here, <laughs> the world in here, in each individual. Um, and how that relates to how we relate to society. You're looking at the global geopolitics scale, and uh, you and I have both been studying this concept of the Anthropocene, this era where so much is in flux, where um, the great acceleration has played out in ways that create huge uncertainty and the new norm where change at a rapid scale and in multiple dimensions is the norm. It's like anyone who thinks we're going back to X is probably fantasizing. So what's your initial thought when you consider that mortality frame and how it shapes us. And then I'll add the other folks. Yeah, none of us are here forever. Um, and uh, the, the, that, that clearly is the, is the human condition. Um, <clears throat> what, a, what fascinates me about trying to engage with this sort of psychological way of, of thinking about it is, is that, as you said, Andy, we live in a, a, an era of very rapid transformation. Um, and for me, of course, the, the, the question is, are there ways of dealing with the kind of psychological difficulties Sheldon has just outlined in terms of, of you know, when you suddenly are faced with your, your own doom or the, you know, the future being a very dangerous, um, likely situation, you've doubled down on, on, on the things that go wrong. Right. Are there ways of short circuiting this so that we can actually um, reimagine ourselves as, as, as making a better world, thinking about how it is that we actually might have new forms of sort of group solidarity that we would identify um, in, in new ways. Are there cultural ways of doing this kind of, of, of pivoting so that we're not looking backwards, trying to simply um, reassure ourselves with more stuff, um, but reassure ourselves with better human relations, with building new forms of, of, of community 
And indeed, in, in a lot of the stuff I've done with uh, over the years on environmental politics, of course, um, you know, some of the most exciting things one actually does is get involved in, in social movements, trying to make a difference. And in terms of dealing with the fear of both one's own personal doom and, and, and the, you know, the doomsters in the environmental discourse, um, you know, the best antidote in my experience has been to, well, do something, get out there, make some new social connections, not reflect in on yourself, but reflect on, on well, how can I make a difference? Um, how can I act and live differently? Who can I contact and work with in new ways? And frankly, um, you know, for me, the, the, the crucial question is, is, is how do we do that? Uh, because um, that seems to be the antidote in many ways to some of the worst um, problems of, 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 of terror management that the Chevens just, just outlined. And for the, you know, to the larger point about the Anthropocene, the, the point there, of course, is that the world is changing very rapidly. We are changing it very rapidly. Um, yes, in many cases, parts of it are being trashed, to use um, children's terms. Um, but the invention of all sorts of new technologies, like the kind of stuff we're using to have this conversation, for instance, is also changing our reality. And it's also, I would presume, and again, Sheldon may be able to come back at this because maybe he's tested it. I would presume it is also likely to construct new forms of solidarity so that Germans understand themselves, not just in terms of Germans, but perhaps as parts of communities that actually interact on, on, on these new technologies. In that case, we should be able to connect with people and, and, and develop solidarities in new ways. Um, uh, the implications for which, um, well, probably Susie has a better um, take on than I do. But for me, that's the, 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 the opportunity that, that is presented by the Anthropocene is to reimagine a lot of things um, and the interconnections both between people and also between people and, 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 and the rest of the universe um, and not just animals, but all sorts of technologies and increasingly artificial habitats, which is what we now live in. Um, can we use that understanding of the future as, as open the all sorts of possibilities for doing things differently um, to deal with the, uh, the, the, the worst psychological and frankly sociological problems that follow from Sheldon's analysis? So I'm bringing in Susie here because, you know, Susie, you you deal with uh, people who are or communities who are disrupted, who are in that state, where they're primed in a sense um, for these kinds of reactions to be in the foreground. And your concept, and I'm going to show it here, of the the adaptive mind. You, you know, you've been making. You have this thing in your. You, I know you have it in your head. I have it in my head. We're trying to. <laughs> We had it's kind of like in that movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind from the 70s, whoever can remember it, where everyone was creating the same sculpture, like people were drawing the same thing. And it was like, can we have an adaptive mind? Can we have some way to foster in ourselves and in our communities something other than that brittle, reflexive reaction that makes us more apt to hate and fear? Uh, so, Susie, what do you think about this? And, and to those who are still in the green room, we're, we're all going to join in here in a minute. Uh, Norman Kearney uh, from Waterloo and and Karen. Great. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me in this conversation. It, it, it's one I've maybe wanting to have for uh, a decade and a half. <laughs> and I guess I want to, well, and I want to actually place it in that larger context, the fact that we're having this conversation. So I got interested in terror management theory um, way back in the early 2000s when I was interested in how do we communicate climate change in a way that doesn't just scare the bejesus out of people, but actually engages them constructively. So exactly, you know, not just becoming aware of the possibility of dying from this particular infliction, but but actually constructively working with it and creating these new futures that Sheldon has been talking about. And at the time, the psychology had not said a heck of a lot yet in how to communicate about climate change in an effective manner. And there was, you know, maybe the social psychology was there and, you know, sort of behavior change stuff was there, but there was really no emphasis on existentialist um, psychologies. And, and what I'm finding really fascinating is that if you were to Google, um, you know, terror management theory plus climate change, you would find a slight, not a very strong uptick um, over time of those two terms. And we're beginning to be or take this psychological turn, if you will, and, and really look at some of the deepest 
drivers of our behavior and our ways of thinking in a way we haven't a decade and a half ago. And so to me, that in and of itself is a really significant moment. And of course, right now with, you know, being in the middle of uh, COVID, an economic crisis, uh, you know, riots in the street, racism, all of these things are putting that existential threat in our face in a way that I think is cumulative, is, is multiplying our awareness and and we're seeing exactly the predicted reactions right we see the reactionary stuff um that the the defensive um you know uh <laughs> cultural projects that we take on to defend our uh the existing status quo and some people mostly from the bottom up trying extremely hard to put a different kind of leadership a different kind of vision forward of how we could respond to this particular moment um a truly transformative opportunity which you know we have yet to to take and i think and this gets me back to the adaptive mind issue for me adaptive mind is a set of capacities skills maybe propensities um that allow us to deal with constant traumatic and transformative change all of which are challenging our sense of what is normal what is good, what is, you know, familiar, what is ours. And we have the choices of how do we react to this? Are we just, you know, hitting everybody else over the head who's taken that away from us, whatever we thought was ours? Or are we engaging with that in a more flex uh, flexible, constructive, ethical manner and move toward the kind of um, positive futures that are at least out there as, you know, something we could actually create. So I'd love to hear a brief uh, reaction from Sheldon uh, to this initial feedback. And then I'm gonna bring in Karen and, and Norman also. So here's well, Susie's definition, by the way, which I keep I keep on hand as a little badge <laughs> in my computer. Yeah, these are uh, both great ideas from Simon and Susie respectively. Um, what I see is, you know, most of our work is um, in a sense just indicative of what not to do. Uh, as you put it, Susie, uh, we see the pandemic and the economic depression and um, uh, you know the earth kind of crumbling um, as just a giant mortality salience induction, uh, you know, to use the jargon from our studies. And just like after September 11th, 2001, you know, we predicted that uh, this would just magnify all of the more unsavory human characteristics. And that's, as you put it, what we're seeing right now. On the other hand, there's an another possibility that Simon alluded to, and that is that, you know, sometimes um, big events uh, like pandemics, I, I like how Albert Camus uh, put it in the last line of the plague when he says, uh, uh, what is it that in times of pestilence we learn that there's more to admire in mankind than to despise um the jury's out on that but i i hope he's right and if we are gonna uh, move in a constructive direction i think that simon is absolutely correct when he suggests that um there are good things happening and we shouldn't lose track. I just saw a comment flashed on my screen that we don't want to just emphasize uh, the negative existential anxieties, uh, as Heidegger pointed out, can bring out the worst as well as the best in us. Uh, but I do think that if we're going to move in a constructive direction rather than destructive, it is going to require a, a radical um, reconception of our identity as human beings. A, a guy named uh, Amin Malouf um, wrote a book uh, in the 1990s in the name of identity violence and the need to belong. And what he pointed out is that, uh, you know, most of the difficulties in the world these days come from uh, unidimensional tribal identities where people define themselves in terms of one element of their identity. Right now, I would say nationalism is big in that regard. Uh, but Malouf's point is that most of us as humans, we have more in common uh, than we are different. 
And if we are somehow able to realize, and Simon, you had a line in your book that I ran into this morning that I meant to remember, but it's along the lines of, uh, you know, we need to identify ourselves as human beings first. And to the extent that we could do that, we can harness our innate pro-social uh, tendencies uh, to make the best of our circumstances. And indeed, in our studies, if um, if we remind people, we call it a common humanity prime, if we say to people in our studies, you know what, humans are one big family, it sounds kind of corny, but it has the virtue of being true, and then we remind them that they're going to die, they don't hate people merely because they're different. And, and so as an abstraction, I think this idea of reconceiving of what it means to be a human being and to emphasize the humanity part, another point that Simon makes in his book that I, I find um, to be remarkably important, and that is that we also have to transform ourselves uh, from creatures who identify with a particular territory in the context of a particular kind of political organization as if it's gonna be that way in perpetuity and um, become more nimble and agile, I suspect along the lines of what Susie is proposing with regard to the um, innate flexibility of our minds. And so I guess that would be my reaction to both of these fine points. So interesting. So I'm gonna pull, um, actually, Give me one. I'm going to show one thing, and then I'm going to pull um, Norman and Karen into the discussion. Um, years and years ago, I was reading Darwin's less famous book, *The Descent of Man*. There was this passage, especially because of my focus on internet connectivity, that keeps jumping out at me when when I hear what I just heard. And here it is: as man advances in civilization and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the same nation, wow. though, though personally unknown to him. This point once being reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and races. And he goes on to talk about actually other species as well, see, the humanity to the lowest animals. So, and I see this and I think, well, the artificial barrier he talked about has been surmounted through connectivity that's now connecting us all. In other words, the global mind, there, there's many different ways of characterizing this uh, moment of where we now have global connectedness. It's still spotty and patchy. There are huge digital divides. Um, even in rural Massachusetts, where Susie is, my friend there says many of her neighbors uh, rely on the telephone, you know, that old fashioned thing. So, so but at the same time, you know, is this, is this a potential way to galvanize things? Now, before you answer, I'm gonna bring in, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back so we can all see each other, not be tiny in the side. Uh, there's Norman Kearney, who's a doctoral candidate, and he'll talk about his um, focus, and and Karen Malpied, who's envisioning where do we go from here in her plays in so many ways. So let me just uh, close that out. So so Norman, what's your what is your focus in your doctoral work? And thank you for being part of this, of course. And thanks for having me. Uh, this is a really stimulating discussion. Uh, my own research is on the social feasibility of sustainability transformations. So there's a, a lot of research on uh, the technical limitations, what type of technologies and policies we would need. But uh, a lot of this research hasn't really addressed what are the cultural uh, barriers and enablers? What are the different sets of worldviews, institutions and technologies that support or would oppose these sorts of transformations? So that's, that's sort of what my work looks at. Terror management is hanging in the background of my work. Um, I read extensively about it during my comprehensive exam phase of my PhD. And um, Sheldon's book, The Worm at the Core, The Worm at the Core is a, a really great introduction uh, for a general audience to terror management and uh, really worth reading. Uh, I, um, I found reading The Denial of Death to be like a life-changing experience. Me too. Um, I, I read through it multiple times. I had, you know, that feeling when you, you are in a lecture or you read a book and you just feel a bit spacey. Yeah. That's sort of what reading this book was like for me. And it made me a more compassionate person because I realized that not just me, but everyone is walking around with an emotional safety, safety blanket on, right? We're all wrapped around with our cultural worldview. And, and when you know that, um, I think you approach people differently. You understand that whatever their worldview, it is serving a function that's helping them get on with everyday life. Um, 
So uh, w for me, as someone working on sustainability, terror management theory is really interesting. Um, there, th there's uh, a line of research in terror management theory that looks at self-esteem as a way of uh, helping people cope with dissenting information. So if you want to have a discussion amongst groups that hate each other, give them a self-esteem boost. Um, there's uh, another line of research, an interesting study by Pellin Kesevier, that looks at humility. And uh, of course, Sheldon knows about the study, uh, and it sounds very similar to this common humanity prime. That's right. Uh, but essentially, if, if you um, can prime people to be humble, or if you are just a more humble person to begin with, you tend not to show the same level of defensiveness when your worldview is challenged. Now, this is really, really interesting to me because we're at a point in history where we need to be making rapid, far-reaching transformations in the ways that we live, uh, as several people have said, in the ways that we conceive of ourselves and in the way that we interact with nature. And that's going to need to happen on the span of decades, not centuries. So all of us are going to need to get very, very good with rapid disruptive change. And that's not going to be possible if we're all holding on to our emotional safety blankets and unwilling to adapt. Um, why humility is so important to me in the context of sustainability is uh, a humble identity or a small ego, as uh, Kesevier describes it, a quiet ego, is not very far off from seeing yourself as a small part of an eternally, uh, infinitely creative universe where you are connected with nature. Uh, there's a whole separate body of literature on connectedness with nature. And uh, I think that if we can foster a stronger connection with nature, we're at the same time fostering humility. And that's one taking down one barrier to worldview change. But on the other hand, there's a related literature, social identity theory, that says the things we identify with are the things that we favor, that we protect, that we're loyal to. So if it's your nation, if you identify I'm Canadian, uh, you know, you might have an in-group loyalty to your nation. You also have in-group loyalties to all of your cultural subgroups, uh, whether that's in environmentalism or right-wing populism. But if nature becomes your in-group, or one, we have multiple layers of identity, right? You have your personal identity all the way up to your various stacked identities. But if, if nature becomes one of your in-groups, then suddenly the uh, institutions and the technologies that got us into these messes, both the pandemic and climate change, and, and here I'm talking about things like neoliberal uh, ideology, free market capitalism, and industrial technologies, where, where there are these rivalries between people having to compete in an economy, between nature and human societies with industrial uh, technologies, these suddenly aren't compatible anymore with your ideology because you you are now damaging the things that you love, the things that you identify with. Now, the question, uh, this is my last point, because uh, I know others want to talk, but the question is how, how could you do something like that? Um, Howard Zinn, his uh, fabulous book, uh, People's History of the United States, really struck me a few years ago. And I remember reading about how uh, early labor union organizers got started in the United States. And they trained thousands thousands of labor uh, organizers and educators and activists. And they went around like almost door to door, city to city, standing on soapboxes, campaigning for uh, labor protections and labor unions. Uh, now this was of course not the only way that, that unions were formed, but this was a major part of it. Uh, and I think maybe we're at a point in human history where we know enough about our psychological limitations, uh, the fact that we're all walking around with these death anxieties uh, that we need to be doing something similar. We need to be having a, a massive mobilization campaign to address this core mental health need, which is to understand that we all are terrified of our mortality and that we sometimes cope with it in a really socially and destructive way. Um, in my community, there's a lot of talk about, well, we, we know all this research, but how do we apply it to people really knowing we're doing it to them? Uh, and I think that's a mistake. I think we should be explicit. I think the, you know, Sheldon's done great work with his, with his public education and, and his uh, books for popular audiences uh, that have translated the science. But I think maybe we need to be actually going out uh, as activists into the community and, uh, and promoting uh, awareness and, and change. Very briefly, the, the, there's also religion, <laughs> which yeah. kind of gets at this in a very deep and profound way for thousands of years. Um, um, and I, I loved uh, Joanne McGarry just posted a comment from she lives in Redwood country in California, herd humility as opposed to herd immunity, 
so how do you kind of normalize that practice? And it, it, this does get at some of these big issues and opportunities I get from my friends at the Garrison Institute and other places working on mindfulness and making it a, a practice. Uh, and I'm just going to mention a couple other things that come to mind. Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is about the deliberative and, and instinctive mind and having the practice of being able to sort of know when you're getting into that mode of being reactive, can you become deliberative in your own practice as you stress over something that's flowing at you on these social media or, or someone you've met who's different. Um, and the last thing is cultural cognition, which is this other theory of uh, Dan Kahane at Yale, culturalcognition.net, which gets at that tribal, the, the, the rationality of irrational behavior. His whole thing is, he's done a, a, um, empirical work showing that basically it's rational to be irrational. Your tribal affiliation is more valuable to you than facts. And you can demonstrate that through research too. Uh, but Although that we... work completely ignores uh, terror management theory. Well, that's, that, that, that would work, be it. it's completely separate there. I don't think Let's he's ever heard of it. Let's get them into the same yeah. room. <laughs> Let's get them into the same room. I'll, I'll do that. Um, but I want to bring in Karen Malpied too from the realm of arts um, by showing you from her most recent play, Other Than We, which I, I'll just do a 30, 20 second description. I, I saw this play in a limited run at the um, at one of the great off-Broadway theaters. Uh, essentially it's humans are at the end of their existence and they've created a overheated climate. They're using biology to try to, biology, biological technology to try to build a new species that can endure with our best traits and and it, it leads in all kinds of wacky ways to uh, the audience wondering about many things. So Karen, I don't want to speak for you, and that's that's the limit of my my thumbnail sketch. So, wh what's your reaction? And how you know when you face these uh, this theory and some of the questions that come up about how to put it into practice? Well, uh, I think we need new stories. So that's what I do. I try to tell the old story in a new and and different way that brings out a lot of the things that people have been talking about. How do we how do we find our connectedness to nature, to one another, to humility? How do we get rid of the uh, the isolated hero suffering and killing uh, you know uh, story? Um, how do we um, live differently? So just to focus on other than we for a minute, uh, a couple of things. Um, it's a story of giving birth. So the the uh, the three younger characters, um, one of whom Tanaka is a refugee from far away and now works as a janitor, was a physician, uh, works as a janitor as so many brilliant people do when they're refugees. Um, uh, and the other two, the, uh, one woman is an obstetrician gynecologist and the other is a, um, uh, a theorist, a, a philosopher. Um, and they decide uh, that they will um, create a new species in which the head and the heart are connected. Uh, and this new species will be able to adapt to the harsh reality of the Anthropocene. They're, they're all living in a dome. Uh, they're the privileged living inside a, a dome, um, tightly managed and controlled by the, the owners of the dome, the, those who, who run things. And they escape from the dome out into a a denuded world in order to give birth to creatures who will have four legs or two legs. They'll be able to run fast or stand up. They have opposable thumbs. Um, and, the, and the big question is, will they be able to think and feel at the same time? Will they have language? And they bring with them uh, Opa, who is the grandfather of Eve, um, uh, um, and he's a linguist. He's a famous linguist. And they bring him to teach the newbies. Uh, and to sort of transmit um, Western and Eastern, but mainly in the play Western, his, his theories of, of mind and, and language uh, to the newbies. And, and uh, so the, the whole question is, um, will this succeed? But it's, but it's predicated around birth, which in my mind is the other, uh, the counter to the hero's story, because birth is the time when we, uh, give ourselves in order to create life, not to take life. We risk our own life in order to create new life. So that's the that's the counter to the heroic uh, quest, which is you risk your life to kill somebody else to become, you know, heroic. So the, so um, they 
and also they know they're going to die. They're very aware that there's not enough food to feed them and the newbies. The men learn how to nurse. Tanaka has a, has a way of, of allowing the men to nurse. So the men actually take part in the nursing uh, of the newbies with the women. Um, and everybody is using up their own uh, bones and their own, uh, their own selves in order to, to feed and nurture uh, this new, this new, uh, these new uh, children of theirs, who are not really their children, they're actually a new species created uh, by them. Um, and the the very last scene, uh, Opa turns into an owl. There's a pre, uh, and and in the very last scene, the newbies, who we never actually see but we only imagine, um, speak, and they speak in a way that tells us and assures us. That, that in fact their heads and their hearts are connected um, and they have understood uh, they are rational, they are imaginative, they are humble, <laughs> they are connected um, and they will go on to create whatever uh, they can. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, the story. Um, so stories are very important and we don't have enough stories uh, that, that allow us to think in the ways that all of you have been talking about, which are so vital and so necessary and so, so much, uh, you know, so, so much the problem. Um, so, Susie, you interact, you interact with, with communities, communities and practitioners, and practitioners in ways in that ways um, perhaps others right. on the call don't or haven't yet. Um, can you describe what that story can look like in terms of your goals? Sorry, can you say it again? There was an echo. I, I know, it was overlapping. I, I couldn't it hear your question. So I yeah. don't know, Karen, could maybe go yeah. on mute while. Yeah, let's okay, try great. to mute it. Now try again. Okay, yeah, try so, again. So, um, you know, we all, I think many of us are grappling with story. Um, to me, so increasingly, the sense is that narrative cap, we're so um, addicted to narrative. Just as Karen was saying, you know, bad guy, good guy. We you put that together yeah. with fear, mortal fear, literally, and and difference and stress, we tend to migrate to narratives that are familiar and comfortable. So we go into our own story. And that's that cultural cognition question too. But the, in a practice where, you know, we're in hurricane season, right now a, a, a cyclone is hitting uh, Mumbai for the first time since the 1940s. And here we have uh, activated hurricane season for sure. Climate change is disrupting many things. Food security is, got, we've got locusts. We're gonna do a session on locusts here soon. So when you're in a practical way trying to build, um, what's the story shape or is it is it less a story and more a conversation, which is different than a story? Let me answer that by making a connection between something that Sheldon put forward and what Karen and, and Simon have put forward. Um, so, we started with with dying. We started with death. And Karen just brought our attention to, if you will, the other end of the transformative cycle, which is birthing something new. And in between is a big transformative arc that I think as a as humanity, as um, society, we have to somehow uh, move through. And I think at this moment that we're in, we don't have anyone really putting forth a, a widely heard frame for how to think about the challenges that we're going through. Um, you know, they're, 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 especially at the practical and, and local level, you often just hear it about whatever, there's a water break um, or there is a, a flooding or there is, you know, we have to deal with adaptation or infrastructure or whatever. It's very practical. It doesn't have a a big story frame around it. And I think what we probably are in, this is my frame that seems to resonate a lot with the communities that I work with um, and in my communications work is that we are in, in the place of a threshold of moving into the unmaking of a lot of the destructive systems that we have been in, um, the ending of things. Um, a deep, deep reckoning, some of which we're seeing at this very moment um, that we're in, right? Where we're reckoned with race, racism, we're reckoning with um, capitalism, we're reckoning with, you know, how we are with each other, men and women, the Me Too movement. I mean, you can just 
add items to that list. We're reckoning with where we need to go. And at some point, we may very well discover, discover not just what we thought humanity is about or what we as, you know, Sheldon, I think, put it as remind us of our humanity, but maybe there are things we haven't yet discovered. And there are, as Karen suggested, ways of being to both human and as individuals as uh, and collective and with nature that we haven't yet discovered what they could be. So this is a truly emergent new way of being on this planet and with each other. And I think when people understand that the suffering that they're in right now is part of that descent, is part of that um, that reckoning, um, and that that's the, that's the task right now, it's an inevitable task, along with all those practical things we have to deal with, the pipes and the barriers and whatnot, I think all of a sudden that work is held in an honorable frame. You know, it has a meaning. And we also need meaning in a time when things fall apart. Um, I've written about this with um, my partner and colleague, Carol Bozanski, um, in a paper called Becoming Homo Sapiens Sapiens. The emphasis being on we yet have to become Homo Sapiens Sapiens. <laughs> we are not, you know, those sentient, wise human beings. So I think this is something that that maybe we just, this is the exact right time for us to be in this falling apart place and the reckoning place and having to discover what it means to be um, to, yeah, to, to be human on this planet. So it's, you know, that's the biggest frame. And then you put all the other smaller struggles that every community goes through um, into that bigger narrative. And it, I find it to work quite powerfully for people because of that, you know, that sense of having hope there is meaning to it. It's not just all the end of things. The there beginning. is a path forward. Yeah. Well, it's the end and the work and the beginning. So <laughs> there's a process to that. Um, but we need those images of possibility that, you know, the imaginaries of what's possible that Simon and Karen have, have put forward. Um, we need to understand why we're struggling so much as, as Norman was saying, you know, what holds us back, why we're um, defending what we have and hold on with claw marks all over it. <laughs> so, so anyway, I'll stop there. I wanted to add a couple of things. Oh. One is um, the theater is is about being embodied and working with with uh, other people uh, in the audience, and there have been studies done on this. Uh, the the stronger the play is, the more people breathe together. Their hearts actually begin to beat in unison. So you actually are creating a community. And of course, theater right now is out the window. It's not possible to do in the same way. We're experimenting with Zoom, etc. But um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, um, a couple of things. I my partner is 87. He played Opa in the. You saw the the film, uh, the the photo of him. So uh, both in our own lives and on the stage, I'm constantly dealing with death, um, with awareness of death and what does death mean and what would a good death be and uh, it's something that the pandemic has has highlighted in this horrific way because people are dying without being able to talk to anyone, without being able to hold the hand of a loved one covered in plastic, um, isolated, uh, which is of course exactly the opposite of a, of a conscious death and a, and a death that is about going back into nature, um, that, that is an awareness of, a, of an opening up, not of an, not of an ending, but of, a, but of an expansiveness. And yes, a giving up of an individual consciousness, but for the sake of a collective consciousness. Um, so the, the actual, uh, experience of, of uh, working with an older actor um, and not being so young myself <laughs> brings me brings me into these questions in a very direct way. And then uh, Edward Said's book Late Style also has uh, something to do with this because Said points out that, and this is true, that many of the many artists have created their greatest work at the end of their life. And it's not about resolution. It's not about figuring it out. But it's a kind of opening up and a kind of breaking through past stylistic barriers and putting things together uh, in a way. And he, he says, um, I can find what he says, yes. Uh, a quote I particularly like. Lateness is being at the end, fully conscious, full of memory, and also very even preternaturally aware of the present. 
Um, so I think there's a tremendous amount to be learned. And the, and the way that seniors have kind of been uh, silenced in this pandemic, totally you're victims. You know, you're the people who are going to be covered in plastic and put on the ventilator and we'll never hear from you again. Um, and, and no conversation, which I would have expected, um, about uh, how do we want to face the end of our lives? Do we, do we want to put young nurses and doctors at risk uh, trying to save us uh, while we're aspirating all over them? Or is, is there something else that would be more meaningful um, and, and more uh, important uh, to, to actually share and actually do? Um, uh, yeah, God, those issues are, every one of us, I'm sure, has had one of those questions raised in personally in your family. Uh, certainly for us, my, my dad, had 92, had a, re, had a close call being stuck in a hospital and not being able to get back into his nursing home because of the lockdown. And, he's, and they, they had a case that came in. And everything you just articulated, I think, poses really strong questions for each of us here. Uh, what's the role of academia in, in facilitating these conversations? Um, how do we better integrate the arts with our just explorations of these questions? There's a, there's a wonderful experiment. Craig Spencer, an ER doctor at Columbia, wrote an incredible essay on the a diary, a, day, a one day diary of death and what, what he was confronting. And it's been turned into a sort of a graphic novelization animation by an artist. I'm trying to facilitate those connections too. I would love actually, Karen, if, if the guild, if, if, the, if the unions would allow, we could do a, a, a reading on this platform of some one of your plays. So the unions would allow that. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about that. So, but, but Sheldon, can you let's circle back to Sheldon a little bit? There's so much, such a rich stew here, and trying to kind of through the next forty minutes, thirty five minutes, let's try to start to shift shift toward like outcomes. Whether it's a new research question, whether it's uh, something that either any of us can do together to do a project that might take this uh, further. So, uh, Sheldon, you want to just give some sense of where what you're thinking right now? Yes, um, my thinking is that um, I'd like to see things move along the lines of what everybody here has proposed uh, at the risk of sounding self-deprecating because I'm normally not, but um, as academics, uh, and I think our work is important, and I, I don't mean to disparage it, but generally, um, and Norman, I appreciate your praise for our book because most of what we write are non-pharmacological inventions for insomnia that are intended for the six other people on earth that might be interested in, in the technical work. And to me, the nothing of uh, genuine value will occur besides enriching the academy. Um, unless these ideas are perfused through the folks that are here with me today. Uh, Norman makes a, a great point uh, in my estimation, for example, when he reminded us that it'd be great to shift the focus from self-esteem um, to um, humility. And to that, I would add gratitude that um, self-esteem way overrated, and it's actually a vestigial remnant of the idea of a self uh, as this autonomous unit. You know, John Locke, we can blame uh, for one of the stupidest ideas in the history of thought, and that's that there was a time way back in the day uh, when there were just isolated on autonomous individuals, and that society is something that we begrudgingly join in order to protect our property. And, and our ideas about self-esteem and making ourselves bigger, bigger, bigger are, are really inextricably tied to the neoclassical economic free market view of the world that venerates the individual. And so, yeah, I think rather than getting bigger, we should work on getting smaller. And so I like the emphasis of trying to shift uh, to that direction, because most of us here today, at least, we have a lot to be grateful for. And I think we all understand the value and virtue uh, of humility. And uh, I love Karen's point um, 
uh, about that um, we need more stories. I just think that um, that's right. Uh, Henry Miller, dead guy of yesteryear, um, uh, he said in one of his uh, essays after World War II, he talked about art as being a stepping stone to reality. The, uh, usually it's the artists of the world uh, that have the boldness and imagination to um, think in broad narrative ways. Also like Rollo May's book, The Cry for Myth, where he points out that that's why uh, we're lost in modernity. We lack a compelling vision that we can share as individuals in a group that can unite us in a sense of meaning and value. Susie's point, um, magnificent, that we should not rule out that in the process of all of these various modes of inquiry that we come to be delighted by learning something about ourselves that we were not previously aware of. And, we, we will continue to do uh, our, you know, laboratory research. We're studying near-death experiences, which turn out to have remarkably transformative effects on the people who have had them. And as silly as it sounds, we're trying to figure out uh, how you can get the benefits of a near-death experience without nearly dying. Um, we're studying um, like how... Drugs. Exactly. That's um, how you get... That, that's the experience of we're all part of nature. I mean, that yeah. was, and in the sixties when I did psychedelic drugs, there, there was a, um, a culture around it and in Becker's book, part of it, but, uh, uh Norman O'Brown and Marcuse and, uh, many, many other people, uh, thinking about connectedness. And of course, uh, when you went on a good trip, um, what you realize is that you're part of nature, not separate from nature and that nature is alive. Um, and the, and there's tremendous gratitude that that comes from that uh, also. And I think if you're talking about um, death, you you do have to put in gratitude because the only way to go towards death is with amazing gratitude for absolutely for life and everybody's life, not just your own, but everyone you know, everyone who's doing something wonderful and trying to do something wonderful and. So I'd like to hear from Norman uh, as a representative of the of E4A. The um, I, I assume you're part of that network with uh, with Katie. It, it's a uh, actually not formally no. Not but, formally. Uh, we run in the same circles. Uh, what I like about it, we've had two sessions, maybe three, if you include this one, or maybe more. Katie um, is part of an ecological economics uh, group um, that span dif disciplines and come together without walls, obviously, um, even be, even before COVID, they were organizing across ca many campuses to get at core issues that don't fit neatly into our existing practices or, or disciplines. I think that's a wonderful, to me, that can crystallize one of the opportunities we all have here. So if you have a core question, driving, driving the question, you know, question-driven inquiry and solution making, as opposed to storytelling, which is, you need to do this to avert disaster risk. Um, feels well, like well, a good way forward. I, I do agree that stories are, are tremendously powerful. I mean, we gravitate them, to them in all aspects of our life, right? We, we tell each other stories when we meet with our family. We go and watch television series because we love the stories. Uh, we play video games because we love the stories. There's, stories are, are such a fundamental part of, of life. Um, so I, I think that's an important part of uh, the solution package, especially trying to overcome this concept of uh, narrative foreclosure, which is yeah. where you've uh, adopted this view that there's basically no retelling of the world. The world is as you as you see it. Um, there's sort of inev inevitability to the outcomes that you've already uh, determined are, are, are likely and nothing can persuade you otherwise that we need stories to lodge us or di dislodge us from narrative foreclosure. I think that's so important. But um, sort of from the ecological economics perspective, I'm glad you asked. Um, the uh, I, I think the the sort of major transformations that we're that we need to be making they're complex, right? They they are not just ideological. They are not just uh, behavioral. They they are interconnected uh, across all of these dimensions. And I, I think a, a major 
um, institutional reform that needs to happen that would support a lot of these other initiatives is something like a basic income. Uh, a basic income combined with a maximum wage. Uh, you can't have a basic income unless you also have a limit at the top because it's really about redistribution. Um, and uh, a basic income would give people uh, some uh, comfort and some uh, buffer against their terror, against their mortality mm -hmm. salience, because a lot of people are struggling to get by from paycheck to paycheck, are constantly forced into uh, work where the working conditions are not ideal because uh, there's a competition, to, uh, you know, it's a race to the bottom. So I think a, a basic income would, would give us all a lot more time to be participating in storytelling, participating in, in local democracy, um, reimagining the way that we want to be living, and also um, would give us all a lot more clout. Uh, it, if uh, employers need to attract us with higher wages uh, and better working conditions, uh, because we can just say, well, I've got a basic income. Uh, that really adds a lot of power to the side of, of workers and families. Um, but I, so I see that as really, really important. But also we need to be looking at restructuring our, our economic institutions. Um, globalized uh, market capitalism uh, forces us to compete against one another for jobs, to compete against each other for a position in the income rung. And uh, I think this also promotes that ideology of separateness, of individualism, of, of my group versus your group. So uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but only just to say that all of these things are interconnected in, in really complex ways. And I do think we need people coming together like this wonderful discussion we're having to think about all the different dimensions. Uh, and at the same time, we need to be mindful of those different dimensions when we're implementing our particular solution. Um, so when I'm when I'm working on institutional reform, I need to be thinking about, well, how can this help storytellers and vice versa? That's uh, that's such a cool approach, Ben. I, I wish we, we, we should have, we actually need to have a subsequent session on this. So like, what is the architecture? What are the widgets? What, what are the capacities in a society you can focus on that can help break old narratives and or enable a, a wide scale reassessment? And that, that idea of the value of basic income, we had a session here just a couple of weeks ago with Katie and uh, uh, Zywert, Catherine Zywert, on the care economy, a different aspect of the value of basic income and other models that can truly support the underpinnings of our, everything we do. You know, the people who are providing care, the people who are home, home care people, the people who are not valued literally in the current economic system. Um, but this is a different one. This is literally taking away some of that stress, some of that, I don't know, some of that factor that gives us gets us in that mode of fight and flight and divide is really interesting. And I think you could probably, each of you could list one or two other traits or properties or, or policies that might shape that ecosystem better. That's pretty cool. So what are- uh, yeah, Reparations would be good in, in the United States. Uh, reparations for slavery. Um, full, so fully integrating uh, past, past trauma and terror. Yes, yes, yes. It's part of a it's part of a basic income, uh, and and part of you know obviously taking funding away from the military and the police and giving it to the communities, valuing the real work that people do that matters, which is caretaking. We've seen that so clearly in in, in the pandemic, um, uh, and and also working less, working less and having more time to do. And Simon, Simon, you had. Andy, yeah, I, I just wanted to tie a few of these threads together, if I might. That would be um, wonderful. In terms of the, the, the telling new stories. One of the things about this Anthropocene concept that you and I have been kicking around um, for, for, for years is, is that it does shift the focus in, in, in some crucial ways. If we're serious about an economics for the Anthropocene, uh, we have to not start where Sheldon was talking about a minute ago with Locke and, and neoclassical economics. Um, you don't start with a consumer and an individual. Um, you, that's just the wrong place to start if you're seriously thinking about an economics for the future. Um, to Karen's um, point about her, her play, I mean, the, 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 the master metaphor running through that um, brief description of her play um, is about trying to make something new. Um, and I think that the, the economics we need to tie some of Norman's um, uh, various themes together uh, is one that, that focuses explicitly on what we are making. Um, are we making uh, an economy that can provide um, care? Are we making an economy that um, makes solar panels? Or are we making an economy that makes more carbon dioxide and, and hence makes the climate change question worse? 
We need to start with an economics that focuses on, on what is being produced, not on rational choices supposedly made by, by consumers. Um, and in terms of telling a very different story, the different story the Anthropocene tells is of a world that is being remade by our choices yeah. and being remade by how we act collectively. Um, it shifts away from, from, from the individual. It focuses on the production process, not the consumption process. And then that leaves us inevitably to the questions of, well, who actually decides what gets made? Um, can we get to an economy that, to, to Norman's point, um, makes uh, decisions driven by what we um, really need rather than by fear? Um, uh, can we build an economy in some ways that, that, that looks um, to sustainability insofar as it doesn't produce vast quantities of carbon dioxide, doesn't produce vast quantities of disruptions of, of, of the remaining sort of quasi wild habitat on this planet? Um, can we build one that also doesn't um, uh, add all too many um, uh, disturbances into the oceans? Because let's face it, life in this um, little biosphere is first and foremost an oceanic phenomena. Um, and we need to tell the story of the planet in those terms because we all suffer from vast quantities of what I like to call terrestrocentrism. Um, because we're an Earth <laughs> species living That's... supposedly on Earth. Um, we don't think about life as the interconnected web of, of oceanic, atmospheric, and terrestrial um, uh, beings. Um, and it's that shift of focus to, 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 to Karen's point about imagining us making ourselves, remaking ourselves differently in the future. Um, it's a really powerful mode of storytelling. Um, the advantage of the Anthropocene is it doesn't just fall back into simple assumptions of human nature divides. Um, it gives us a much, much longer time period to think about the human story. Um, it gives us a, a, an option to think about quite literally what kind of future planetary habitat for all of us that we, that we are actually making. And from there, you then begin to think about, well, how do you act differently? How do we invent new economic um, uh, structures that don't, aren't just driven by what the advertising agencies can, can convince us will um, help us manage our, our, our terror um, uh, uh, issue. Uh, and I think that the cultural politics of, of, of thinking about how it is that we advertise um, uh, is, is, is something that we need to add into this, this conversation too, because the sheer amount of money that big corporations spend on advertising agencies and the sheer amount of images that we are bombarded by um, uh, shapes our, our subjectivities in all sorts of ways that, frankly, most of us are unaware of most of the time. Just think of all the ads. We... Story. That's the story of a, of a, of a planet being remade. Um, uh, and I think that, that there's a powerful series of narratives that can be spun off about that. Could, could I add um, to this? We need to yeah, pay yeah. a whole lot more attention to. Susie? So, so I'm, I'm really interested in this conversation about what narratives guide us. And I want to just point out the very obvious thing, which is that there's six of us sitting here all with very light skin, all very privileged, um, four of them males. Um, and I think that's a very slim slice of the narratives that we maybe ought to think about or, or consider. Um, so I think it's just a you know, it's just a reality that we need to have someone ask in the comments about, you know, what's the next thing you can do before 20, November 2020. I think one of them is to have these conversation in a much more diverse mode than we are so used to having. And to maybe not begin because it's so, so derivative of the imageries and imaginatives of, of what we already have, not begin with a form of economy that we need. Um, that that is going to be one element of it, but you know we started out with um, existentialist psychology, where you know it's it's about the fear of death and what we do with that. Um, you know there are narratives out there that drive people to explode themselves in the midst of last masses of people to you know fly planes into into buildings. Those are very powerful narratives and. It's probably not the ones we're talking about, but I think we need to be very careful about, you know, how do we actually create life sustaining, life nourishing narratives um, and, and account for the need for these sacred values that so many people hold um, that are, you know, tying right back into um, terror management theory and, and our need to somehow 
sustain who we think we are, even if that is being recreated um, in a new fashion. So I think there's, it, it's just a really tricky territory that we shouldn't assume when we say we need new narratives that we all have the same narrative in mind and we should be yeah. very careful to think about what they are. I also wanted to quickly add one other thing about, you know, we talked earlier about the benefits of near-death experiences, the benefits of drugs that expand our possibility. We live in a time when our culture has essentially lost all relationship to ritual um, that actually creates those um, uh, endings very deliberate endings and moving into new ways of being, new phases. So, you know, traditional cultures, uh, other cultures still have those kinds of rituals. And I think they are just as fruitful as a place to look um, for how do we consciously leave behind something old and risk letting go and move into a new place. Um, and we should revive them and reinvent them for this time. Incredibly Can I build on something Susie was saying? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, so I, I completely agree. And I think we would, I mean, Susie has already acknowledged this, but uh, I think we'd be remiss not to acknowledge the, the terror, because we're talking about terror today, that, that so many Black Americans and, and, and Black people in, in every country are facing right now, and, and to condemn the police brutality, and especially condemn the reaction by the Trump administration uh, of threatening to use the military against black folk. I mean, if you need to reach out to your black friends and tell, you, tell them you love them. If you can donate to an organization, you should donate. If you can go to a protest, you should protest. We all really need to pull together and support uh, uh, black people in our countries right now, wherever we are. Uh, and this is, of course, is not limited to this crisis. We need to be mindful of these sorts of things when they're happening to any group in society at all times. But now is the time to support black people. Um, but on the point of this being a very white panel, uh, which is completely true and, and something I was feeling anxious about uh, coming into it, um, uh, I also think that uh, Susie's completely right. We don't know the narratives that the various different groups in society are telling or want to be told. But I thought something um, that a study Ecos Polling did in Canada recently asked the question, when the COVID-19 crisis ends, do you expect Canadian society to return to the status quo? Or do you expect a broad transformation of our society? And 73% of people polled said they expected a broad transformation. So this is pretty cross-cutting. There's a lot of people uh, all across society expecting that there's going to be transformation. And on the note of including different perspectives in, in all communities, I think it's really important that whatever transformations are coming are done democratically. Uh, and that is going to involve things like, I think, citizens' assemblies, where you get representative panels together, it could be in using new e-democracy tools if we're still in a lockdown situation. Um, wh whatever it is, uh, it needs to be democratic um, and, and it needs to be inclusive. Um, I want to show this idea. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Back in March, I, had, I pitched this panel to South by Southwest, this annual conclave. It didn't happen, of course. And this gets at a point that is one of my big focal points points these days, which is enabling community capacity for impact on its own. So this gets exactly to the point of inclusion and, and diversity, not because my panel was diverse, uh, Native American, African American heritage, um, uh, a woman working in wildfire zones in the West, a woman working in urban schools on energy efficiency. It's what, as you see the headline, how do you scale local successes in climate and or resilience up and out? How do you, can we what platforms can be created so that I don't have to mediate anything? So I can take myself out of the equation as, as the white privileged elder and just let it all flow. What are the properties of the internet? Um, there's, a, there's a group called um, climateaction.tech who are, I'll show you, I may as well, who are within the community of technologists in Silicon Valley. They're trying to look at the internet they built with all of these biases and filters and algorithms that take us to that consumptive part of us and the divisive part of us. And can we tweak them? What can be done with the actual algorithms to be more responsible to have a code of ethics? So there is there are sporadic er efforts like this underway. And I think, you know, more, more better. And I just, how do we scale even having th this conversation is privileged in so many ways. Uh, on the same platform, I did a connection two weeks ago with uh, Guatemala, Senegal, 
um, Uruguay and Colombia, you know, where we're discussing live issues about food security and climate. I had a live session with people in Bhopal, India, average citizens who had forged their own food network. They turned a plastic reduction campaign, middle class campaign in Bhopal into a food provision campaign for lockdown, deeply poor people. So that's, you know, if I can make this thing become a property that we can all exploit is that's that's one of my paths forward to take away some of that sense of of, of you know control I, I the last thing i want is control so uh but i want to hear more from simon and Susie and everybody before we close out we have another 15 minutes and that's, that's a good amount of time to kind of make some final points and i want karen karen's plays to be more widely seen <laughs> <laughs> thank you I, I just wanted to say i teach environmental justice and uh theater at john jay college and my students are overwhelmingly students of color immigrants um uh you know amazing amazing students and one of the things that i let them do or encourage them to do uh during the pandemic was turn in their coronavirus diaries keep a diary um because so many of my students were also essential workers um so many of them had illness in the family um uh you know living in tiny apartments trying to um one with a brother with who was an ME, uh, EMT, and she was working in a in a uh, Hasidic grocery where nobody would wear masks because the the word on the street was that COVID didn't attack the religious communities, right. but only you know. And she was trying to keep her mother safe, who was an asthmatic garment worker. I mean, the the stories talking about the narratives, the stories were so amazing, but uh, and are so amazing. But but the journals um, uh, taught the students that their story was important, that their story mattered. Uh, and, and this is so important because uh, again, when, when, when I'm talking about new narratives as an artist, I'm talking about the narratives that I want to create. I can't create narratives for everyone. I can only create the narratives I want to create. But I also wanna teach people when I teach um, the importance of creating their narrative and, and also want to show them that it doesn't have to be violent. So, so often when I, I, my students have the opportunity to write their own plays on any subject. And one of the experiences I had was a guy trying to write a play, but he could only write the murder and the death. He could only write the, the cop killing and the shooting. And as I gave him, focused in on more material and gave him material, he was able to write a play that was not that, that was, uh, you know, a different narrative, a different way of, of telling his story that didn't get caught up in the stories that he's been told, which is, you know, which are the violent, uh, you know, stories. That concept of narrative foreclosure, ending it, is, is very valuable at that context, too, that you just mentioned for students and for uh, unvoiced communities, uh, that, for all of us, really. I, I used to I developed the hashtag narrative capture, mostly in the context of journalism. It's something to avoid. And you're demonstrating that narrative foreclosure, narrative capture, whatever you want to call it, limiting the range of what we feel is a narrative for us in a community, constraining that artificially is, is an important part of going forward. I mean, not constraining. I just to show you, like, how many of you have been to Ikea, reluctantly or otherwise? <laughs> So I noticed, um, I, I, to me, Ikea is a narrative capture uh, model. You come in that store and you're captured and they take you through. <laughs> and it reminded me so much of, the, of what um, Temple Grandin yeah. has done with animals, where you know, if we're gonna have slaughter, let's at least have it be as not humane, but cow-mane. Like, like, so when the cow is going through, it's not being stressed. It's not having its terror moment. Um, and, and but who wants to be in a slaughter shoot or or in a capitalist uh, consumptive <laughs> narrative when you can break it and how do we develop that capacity is a really important thing to think about uh, so many I, I so many to, rich veins here susie yeah yeah i love to pick up on Ken and and what you just said um because what it speaks to in my mind is that we don't only have to learn to live with the fear and be constructive in the face of it you know which is where we started but it's so many different feelings that we have about the situations we are in, whether it's anger that, you know, you're telling a story, Karen, about the student 
who was able to transform his anger into a different narrative, right? His his one story. Not his, um, not his anger. His anger was there, and anger is a very important part of making art. I don't think you can make art without being angry, uh, at least in part. His anger was there, but he didn't have to annihilate his characters. He didn't have to annihilate them before right. they came to some kind of understanding of what their life meant, right? Right. So, I'm not talking about eliminating any feelings. I'm talking about being able to live with all of them and maybe not live them out in a destructive manner as we go forward, because things are going to get a lot more difficult than they are already, given yeah. the trajectory and inbuilt, uh, you know, momentum behind climate change alone, not to speak of all the rest of the concurrent challenges that we're getting ourselves into. So I feel like it, we're really in this moment of needing to re-inhabit our emotional space and become mature in how we work with them in a in a whole variety of ways. And this to me is the beauty and hope of this moment that we actually can grow up as human beings. And with that then, you know, create a different kind of future. Wow. Uh, all I can say is there has to be a chapter two and three and four here that this is a new, I think this is a it's not a narrative. You were weaving a, a vision. Uh, you know, to me, the blogging I did at the New York Times for nine years on Dot Earth taught me, led me away from the conventional journalism practice of telling stories. Hey, that was a great story. Hey, a great get, you know, for the investigative pieces toward um, shaping better conversations. And this is sort of a second phase of that, which was sort of enforced on me in this new initiative. By the lockdown, I went on StreamYard. I saw someone using StreamYard as a way to build a, a video live uh, presentations. And I thought, OK, so March 15th, I just tried this. I, I think we're going in a really good direction here. Um, and especially with E4A, the participation of Katie, who, without whom this particular nexus wouldn't have happened. And then I thought, wow, Susie would be good in this. And, and, and Karen, because I've enjoyed her plays. Um, so I, I would like us to think collaboratively of a way to um, make this a track essentially. So we're we're on a track here, although we don't want to be too captured by the track, you know, too quickly. Uh, there was someone recently, oh no, it was Peter Coleman, right? Who said, who, who's so much about cooperation and conflict. You know, I, I, I'll just give you a tiny quick example. I used to think at the New York Times, they had something called room for debate, a daily feature where something big is happening. Trump does something with the, with the Bible and they would just round up five people. Hmm. Maybe probably diverse, but then they would all kind of urinate on the fire hydrant and leave. So it had no, and it was all framed as a debate. In other words, win, lose. And, and so I, and I've been thinking about, well, we need a room for agreement, room for agreement. And then Peter, when I had him on here a week ago, he said, no, you need room for exploration, which is distinct from agreement. And he said, what they do at the uh, the Center for Cooperation, Conflex uh, Cooperation, Complexity, and, and, um, conflict is is fine cooperation even if you don't agree <laughs> like what are the dimensions in which through which you can start to build something constructive knowing it's not perfect knowing it's iterative and so i just think we should just try to stick with this we're pretty much we have about seven minutes left for anyone who has a grand i'd like to hear from the young generation here too you haven't gotten your doctorate yet and you are linked i, I what is your community feeling these days um norman in terms of you know, think about what your interactions with Katie and others. Um, I imagine the terror management TMT is weighing on everyone here in one way or another, but uh, people I know, like my younger son, who's 22, seem to face a really much particular, much more intensive moment than, than the, the rest of us. So what, what are you all feeling? And can you keep up the energy to do what needs to be done? Well, I'm 32 going on 33, but I'm going to take from that that you think I look like I'm in my early 20s. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, people, so my community are other graduate students right now. Like in my previous years, I, I did a lot of community work, uh, organizing participatory budgets at, at the grassroots level. Um, so I was in different circles, but now, uh, you know, it's all privileged folk like me who are in graduate school and, and who have a lot of, uh, concerns before the pandemic, before um, uh, what's happening right now um, in terms of like job market, 
So academics do not face a very pleasant job market right now. Mm -hmm. uh, to support for graduate students is pretty low in financially. So uh, a lot of students come out of school with debt and unemployed and having spent many of their prime working years in school. So they're that much farther behind their friends who are buying houses. Um, so, you know, when I talk with my friends uh, who are mainly studying similar things that I am, um, there's, there's a lot of pessimism about the future, uh, combined with a lot of hope. Like we, we have uh, all these ideas and, and there's more potential than ever technologically, uh, institutionally, uh, to be making the important changes that, that we all sort of know need to happen, whether it's making our societies more democratic or more equitable, uh, more inclusive. My, my own feeling, because I don't really feel I can speak on behalf of youth um, for various reasons, um, but um, my feeling is it would be a real historic tragedy if we did not learn from this pandemic and the lockdown and funnel that into the societal scale reforms that are needed to be dealing with climate change, to be preventing the future pandemic. You know, th this pandemic, if you were a frontline worker or you were a healthcare worker, um, it was a very different reality than I've lived, right? I've been working from home. Um, but a lot of us were able to wait this thing out at home. Uh, and, and personally, my husband and I had been living long distance for four years and just ended up living in the same place a month before the lockdown started. So <laughs> it was a blessing in disguise for us. Um, but that's not most people's reality. And, and more to the point, climate change is not a problem that anyone is going to be able to wait out at home. Right? It, there's no escaping that once its effects start to become severe. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a frontline worker, or essential worker or a non-essential worker, we're all going to be suffering. So for me, I want to see a political movement emerge from this pandemic that is moving us towards um, a care economy, a care society, uh, a society that takes risks and uncertainties seriously, that has uh, an anticipatory approach to governing where we don't know if a particular problem is going to occur, but the fact that it could means that we need to be preparing adequately for it. Um, and circling back to, I think maybe Simon was mentioning this, you know, I've, my whole life I've often wondered, what is this all for? Like, what, what, what is this whole rat race about? Um, and uh, to me, the only thing that makes sense moving forward is, is building societies that are focused on human dignity, that are focused on human needs. And that really is not in the political parlance. Like, yeah, we'll have debates about our healthcare system or whether education should be publicly or privately paid for. But the, the wider discourse about are we a society that's planning several generations ahead? Are we a society that's anticipating risks and preparing for them? Are we a society that is focused on human needs and, and non-human needs? and flourishing and dignity and development. Those are the things that I wanna see on the, on the table politically. I wanna see political parties emerging from this that are explicitly reacting to this pandemic um, and taking a wider focus. Um, that's my hope. It's a grand one. And a it is, and it's disrupted by things like the brutality of the police in the United States. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the pandemic in some ways could have the exact opposite effects of what I'm hoping for. Um, some polls have shown that the environment has fallen several uh, rungs down the ladder of priorities that people report uh, when they're interviewed uh, and that the economy has, has moved ahead. And so uh, I think it's really important to link those two things, to see the environment and the economy as, as inextricably linked. And if we really want to avoid these sorts of consequences, we need to see them more holistically. And social support, supporting the full society. As you said, I think what you said about the basic income is a really important part of the conversation going forward. Susie, I think we should do one of these just on the adaptive mind. So let's use this I'd as a ramifying to. moment where we, you, everyone here, we could list three or four topics where we could branch out and go forward more on this. I, We're kind of at the end of our moment. Uh, everyone has lots of work to do. Uh, Sheldon, did you have a last thought that, you know, are we... I hate to bring this up at the ending, but there was this discussion, including some pieces you wrote about how without work, terror management, that, that background forcing can generate the, the and be exploited by those seeking authoritarian and um, top-down 
the models that, that I think many people will regret later. So just a last quick going away thought from you that can let us embrace the terror of mortality, but also embrace the prospect we can come through this uh, moment. Yeah, um, uh, all of the above. I think that this was a great gathering of right-minded people um, who have never met each other doing our best to interface with ideas that might be of a, a future utility. And th this gives me um, great hope. And I, I hope that this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation, not only between us, but between us and the folks that have been listening in today. I've just been glancing at some of the comments and they're magnificent. They are, there's a bunch of really cool people out there. So uh, thank you. So Susie, we'll do more, right? I've been wanting to get you on here in depth, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, I'd love to. A, I have to reread a little boilerplate <laughs> here at the very end. Um, I thank you all profoundly for uh, sharing your time with me today and the rest of the community. When this goes, when we're done in a moment, you can share the results on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. It's all, all the links I'll share with everybody. They're easy for everyone to find. J.MP slash sustain what live is the. Um, website, and I'm just going to read this little production note because I have the fortune of having support of the Columbia University. Sustain What is a global online conversation identifying solutions to the complicated, shape-shifting, and epic challenges of humanity's great acceleration and, right now, the great pause. A prime focus is making sense of and getting the most out of the planet's fast-forward information environment, the one Earth system changing faster than the actual environment, it often seems. This webcast is produced as part of my work building Columbia University's new Earth Institute initiative on communication and sustainability. Simple goal, making information matter, and shaping a better planet and societies. Uh, for the time being, these sessions focus on mitigating the unfolding societal disruption and loss driven by the global spread of COVID-19. But we'll dip into other subjects and solutions when the time is right, when the time is now, as we've already demonstrated. I hope you'll all share this and stay tuned and, and offer your suggestions for future programs and stay well and stay safe. And when you get a chance, either virtually or ultimately physically, hug um, someone who has been on the front lines in all of this and uh, stay well. So thank you all very much.